Hello, everyone. Today I'm joined by Summer Blackman, an intellectual property and entertainment attorney with Grant Attorneys at Law. How are you doing today, Summer? I'm doing very well, Tony. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. So tell us a little bit about your background and what inspired you to practice intellectual property law. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd have to say that um, my surroundings definitely um, extremely influenced me in molding my decision to practice IP law. Uh, so for those, um, IP is intellectual property, shorthand. Um, so although I didn't have any lawyers in my family, my dad was an employment and labor mediator and arbitrator, and my mom was in education, and she was committed to ensuring uh, disadvantaged students weren't left behind in the system. Um, I'll never forget um, when I was growing up, I was introduced early to Black inventors like Garrett A. Morgan, the inventor of the traffic signal, um, Elijah McCoy, the inventor of the lubricating cup, and they named a real McCoy. And while I understood that these were inventions, I had no idea that this would be the beginning of my interest in intellectual property because I had no idea what that meant at the time. Um, and for one particular school project, I think it was like grade six or grade seven, um, we were tasked with inventing something. And I invented the nail clipping holder. To this mm -hmm. day, I thought that I was a genius and my 11 year old, 12 year old self was, you know, very innovative. Um, so I was really interested in that from a very young age and learning about intellectual property. And then we also have my sister. Um, she's a singer, songwriter, violinist, and Broadway actor, currently in Hades Town on Broadway. And for myself, I'm a classically trained pianist. I started playing the piano when I was five, um, and I learned how to play other instruments like the alto and tenor saxophone and steel pan. So I pretty much grew up in a family that really valued advocacy, education, and the arts. Uh, so the areas of IP that really interested me were trademarks and copyrights and how those concepts specifically interacted in the music industry. Uh, so for those who don't know, IP or intellectual property is a term that includes trademarks, copyrights, patents, industrial designs, and other forms of intangible assets. Um, and so then we get to high school now, I became much more involved in the entertainment industry um, trying to figure out exactly what in the entertainment industry and IP I wanted to do. So I interned and worked at various music companies. And from then I knew that I wanted to be um, an intellectual property lawyer. So um, I was involved with the American Federation of Musicians, um, a music management company. Um, and then after that, obviously going to um, university and then law school, I had my first law degree at Cardiff University in Wales. And after a number of years in the work field, I completed a master's of law in intellectual property at the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. And as you just mentioned, now I work at Grant Attorneys at Law where I practice IP and entertainment law. Interesting background. And I know a while back you wrote a paper on the connection between intellectual property and social justice. Can you share what your discovery was? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess a bit before about what I discovered, uh, I've always been interested in learning about how IP properties or IP rather um, of Black people across the diaspora has been protected, used, and unfortunately abused and exploited. So I also wanted to investigate social justice. And we're always thinking about social justice um, in the criminal justice system. So I wanted to explore social justice and how it manifested in the entertainment industry. So the intersection of intellectual property and social justice just made sense to me. Um, while I was completing the master's of intellectual property at the University of New Hampshire, uh, I decided to write this paper. Um, so it was on the concept of a cover song and how it relates to copyright law and mm -hmm. its effects on the Afro-Caribbean artists as well as African-American artists and African artists. So my paper focused on Afro-Caribbean and African artists as I believe the literature on African-American artists um, is pretty lengthy and robust, um, whereas that of um, Afro-Caribbean artists and African artists wasn't so much in the literature that I've found. Sure. Um, so I'm sure we're very familiar with what a cover song is. Um, a cover song, also known as a remake or a re-recording of a song um, under the US Copyright Act. For a song to actually be considered a cover song, 
it has to conform to the style of the actual original song and interpretation of that performance. And so what I found was that for Caribbean artists specifically, or especially, uh, cover songs allowed an entire genre to be commoditized, which translated into unequal protections and a continued state of economic disparities among the Caribbean artists that I researched. So I don't know if you know the song, Hot, Hot, Hot. I'm pretty sure Red you hot, know. Hot, hot. Exactly, we all know that song. Mm -hmm. If you've been on a cruise or you've been on a resort at a Caribbean island that caters to American tourists, it's definitely the party starter that everyone knows, uh, you know, once they hear this song, they're gonna be doing, you know, they're gonna be practicing their limbo skills. Mm -hmm. So actually, if you type in Hot, Hot, Hot in YouTube, um, the American version of that song, which is sung by um, Buster Poindexter, um, he will be at the top of the list because that is the version uh, that is predominantly known. Wow. The original version is actually by a Montserrat artist named Arrow. Uh, Montserrat is a small Caribbean island between Guadeloupe and St. Kitts and Nevis. So that was one example where I was like, wow, this is really interesting how Caribbean artists, you know, they're they're producing really great music that the world loves, but no one really knows of them because their version is outshadowed and outshined by American artists who are, you know, they, they're allowed to do this. There's, you know, cover songs are are permitted and it's it's of the law, but it's just the, the way that these um, cover songs have allowed American artists to outshine the Caribbean artists. Mm. Um, another example that everybody knows, the lion sleeps tonight. So we all know the Lion King, all of us. And um, so this is a profitable song, very, very profitable. And also a very great example of cultural exploitation. Mm -hmm. So the original song is by South African named Solomon Linda. And the actual name of the original song was called Mbumbe. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Mr. Linda signed an agreement with a record company in Johannesburg, South Africa, where he essentially sold all of his rights to Mbumbe for 10 shilling, which is like the equivalent of eight cents in the US. So there was a documentary that um, talked about this, 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 um, this song called The Lion Share. And it was explained that Mbumbe, interestingly enough, was a word that Americans just couldn't quite get. So they anglicized this word and instead they named it Wimowe. Mm. This was done by um, composer George Wees, um, and he he changed the English version from Mbumbe to Awimowe. So if you remember the song, Awimowe, Awimowe, that's what we know it to be now. And so once anglicized, um, there was an American duo group called The Tokens. This is a, a white group. Uh, they became recognized as a singing group to popularize the song. And so from then on, Wimowe, now known as The Lion Sleeps Tonight, has been recorded over a hundred times using commercials and as I mentioned, you know, in The Lion King. And then there's also the Broadway play, um, The Lion King. So as the years went on, more covers were created um, and Solomon Linda, the South African, his involvement just faded away. And so in the documentary, um, The Lion Share, um, it was chronicling the uh, heirs of Linda trying to figure out how they can settle the lawsuit and get back royalties from Disney, who is the owner of um, The Lion King. And although they did settle the lawsuit, um, you know, the, this deal, this was hidden. So we don't know exactly how much they were success, successfully allowed to retrieve. Um, but we do know that 25% of the song's past and future royalties um, would go to um, Linda's heirs. However, they didn't say exactly how much um, was owed. So while this example um, isn't, uh, you know, it happened because there was not a lot of knowledge for Linda to know, okay, this is not a good deal for me. Right. Um, so this is like a, a, an example of an inequitable licensing or ownership transfer um, because of the unequal bargaining power from, you know, the record company to just this person who just wanted to make music. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, another example um, is Harry Belafonte's Deo. We all know Deo, we say Deo, we say Deo. We all know this song, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is an album of a Caribbean folklore. And in its efforts to market the album, RCA, the record label, 
uh, they had a cover mock-up representing Belafonte on a bunch of bananas superimposed on his head. He was barefoot, donning a big tooth grin, and he was saying, yes, come to the islands, you know? Um, so although this notion of the Caribbean was halted by Belafonte because he was a very good advocate in, you know, speaking up for his rights, um, this was like a very good example of how uh, this exoticized and commodified calypso and reggae mm -hmm. and provided like a stereotypical imagery of what, you know, Americans are onlookers of people who are, you know, really interested in this music and the culture, but that is like their reference for um, the Caribbean, you know, thinking of, oh, this is like very fun. This is very, you know, light, lighthearted. Meanwhile, Calypso, which is a, a genre that was born out of West Africa, um, there's a lot of politics in Calypso, but that that part of it is not really, you know, talked about because it's just seen as like the fun party song that you listen to on cruises. So that that is something that really annoyed me, but it was really interesting to like learn about um, all of uh, the ways that Caribbean music, uh, Amer African American music as well, is just exploited and commoditized for um, for you know the good times that it has, and not the actual not so good times. Yeah. Right. So I don't know. I feel like uh, with regard to the the music that's created in the Caribbean, what I found is that even though um, Caribbean islands like Trinidad, Bahamas, Barbados, Jamaica, they've adopted standard copyright laws and protections, it's the enforcement, it's the policy, it's the 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 varying um, ideas of ownership where it's just difficult to reconcile with. So uh, with the issues of ownership, collaboration and community, the intellectual property international system is very individual based. While I believe that the black diaspora uh, produces its best creativity on a collaborative level. Mm -hmm. And so the concept, co the concept of communal ownership of musical genres from West Africa has been passed down from generations to generations, as I mentioned, like Calypso and reggae, but it's the communal and the collaboration that I think really makes it special. So that is something that um, IP scholars like Peter Jazzy points out that um, it's a type of willful exclusion of many of the world's cultures, scientific and artistic contributions um, mm -hmm. in the established more individualistic international IP systems. So basically, unfortunately, my paper ended by saying, you know, uh, cover songs are allowed. Um, the the availability to protect musical genres like calypso and reggae is difficult to do as a genre in itself. So there's still that that issue of how um, these genres can be protected and not exploited in the way that they have been. Wow, that's really interesting. Are there any other types of IP or areas where IP intersects with social justice? Mm, absolutely. So yeah, so my paper, it focused a lot on copyright law. Um, which protects the expression of an idea, whether that be through music, photography, art, film, et cetera. Uh, trademark is another great example. Um, and trademarks are words, they could be logos, it could be phrases, shapes, and that serves as a source indicator of goods and services. So I'm gonna give you another example that we all know about, Aunt Jemima. We all know Aunt Jemima, uh, put that syrup on the pancakes, it tastes delicious, um, but recently, um, it has been under fire for uh, racial stereotypes and imagery in connection with the goods and services. Well, the goods, so this is the syrup. Mm -hmm. So Nancy Green was the woman who portrayed the original Aunt Jemima trademark, and she was a former enslaved woman who served as a nurse and caretaker for a white family. And during the protests in 2020, sparked by the death of George Floyd, Quaker, Quaker Oats, who owned the Aunt Jemima brand, admitted that the brand was rooted in racial stereotype. And as a result, they changed the name and the packaging. So that was something where I was like, yeah, I've been following this story for a really long time. And before, um, you know, the outcry of all the, the racial um, upheav upheaval and all the, you know, all the talk about, okay, let's, let's get to the, let's get to it. Let's try to fix these things, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's good that they're fixing them, but they're only fixing them because they're being pressed to fix them, right? right? They wouldn't have fixed them if nobody pressed them. 
Um, and think on like a macro level in terms of patent law, which is the law that protects inventions. Um, I'm thinking about like social justice as it relates to access to medicine. Um, there's a lot of tension between the protection and ownership of medical innovations and global public health and access to generic medicines. Um, so I know that this wouldn't be like a patent example, but when I think about uh, medicine and social justice, I think of Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks, who the, the HeLa cells were made from. And so those are you know just a few ways that IP and social justice interact, um, particularly to trademarks, copyrights, uh, and patents. But then I'm also thinking about how IP and social justice intersect um, with regard to access to IP education and equal opportunities in mm -hmm. IP focused careers. So there was a recent statistic from the American Intellectual Property Law Association that said that 1.7% of IP attorneys are black. 1.7%, and that's a statistic in the US. That's grossly low. Um, so I've had countless conversations uh, with a number of people and heard numerous stories of black lawyers who didn't even know what intellectual property was until they got to law school. I've also spoken to law students who have had an interest in patent law, but because they, you know, they don't have a background in science, uh, this path into that area wouldn't be possible because for patent law, you have to have a background in science in order to uh, do that type of law. Um, so for me, I think an introduction to intellectual property um, at a much earlier stage than, you know, finding out about it in law school would help increase the number of Black IP attorneys. Um, what I think has been good is the increase in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics initiatives that has been incredible. So there's a number of uh, STEM programs for youth who can learn about, you know, science and technology and engineering and math. Mm -hmm. And I know that a number of those programs also introduce, you know, uh, patent attorneys and have them speak on panels and tell them about what they do, which I think is amazing. Um, a colleague of mine recently told me that her seven-year-old was in a summer STEM program, and I thought that that was awesome. And so I'm from Toronto, and um, there's this brilliant, brilliant program called Visions of Science, headed by Eugenia Addy. Um, it's a charitable organization that exists to advance the educational achievement and positive development of youth from low income and marginalized communities through meaningful engagement in STEM. And so uh, this kind of program, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And I would like to see more of that. Um, a few years ago, I started a workshop series called Creative Rights. Um, so I wanted to ensure two main things in that program. One, providing intellectual property information to people in the black community through uh, black intellectual property lawyers on panel discussions. And two, visibility. Obviously you can't be what you can't see. So showing the community that there are people that actually look like them doing things that they may never have heard about and then are actually interested in once they learn more about it. So I'd love to see more initiatives like that centered on trademarks and copyrights um, and maybe even teachings in elementary schools or high schools so that you know when the guidance counselor says, hey, what do you wanna be? Somebody could actually say, "Oh, I want to be an I want to be a trademark lawyer, or I yeah, I want to be a patent lawyer," because that's not something that you normally hear uh, when you have these kinds of conversations with guidance counselors, right? Um, but I also know that the the United States Patent and Trademark Office they've implemented a number of educational initiatives to make learning about IP more accessible, um, and I think that's great. Um, and obviously the internet, on the internet, there's no shortage of information. On YouTube, you can find a number of like videos of people, you know, teaching a number of areas. But what I'd like to see more of is more grassroots kinds of initiatives where it's not the people having to seek out the information, it's the people with the information going to the people and providing it to them. Right. Right? Yeah. No, that's a great point. Um, in terms of trends or future trends what intellectual property i guess trends or developments are you seeing or do you expect to uh influence the near future mm -hmm. so i think with the pandemic i've seen like a huge increase in trademark applications mm -hmm. um there was actually a 40 percent increase in trademark applications in the u.s over the past year from 2021 wow. and so for me this represents that okay so pandemic times, people are home, 
they're thinking of different projects that they could, you know, get their hands on. Okay, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. This is great. Oh, I have a brand now. Oh, I got to protect my brand. Mm -hmm. So I think that's amazing. So I think that is, it, it may continue to rise, but I think it may level off um, now that there is a recession maybe coming. So people would want to make sure that their coins are in check for what they already have going on. Um, but I think that, yes, I think uh, trademarks has become something that people are understanding that they need to make sure that they have um, in place if they are going to start a business. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that sync licensing. Um, so sync licensing uh, is like an agreement between a music user and the owner of a copyrighted composition. Uh, so this grants permission to the release of a song in a video format. So just think of like music placements. Um, uh, so on a TV show, if you have a theme song, like we all know what that theme song is. So that composer and the recording artist who have, who own the copyrights to that, um, they are gonna be getting a lot of royalties continuously because mm -hmm. that theme song is gonna be used over and over and over and over again, right? Um, I think we're seeing a lot of older catalogs um, being profitable income streams for songwriters. Um, and I don't think that's going to stop mm. at, at all. Um, and then there's also, um, and there, I think that there's going to be an increase in copyright claims. So recently there has been a new copyright claims board that was implemented to assist everyday creators. Um, so we all know that, you know, litigation is extremely expensive. So this copyright claims board is a way to provide a much less expensive avenue for copyright owners to bring copyright infringement claims, takedown claims, um, whether the work is registered with the copyright office or not. And uh, yeah, so these kinds of claims, they can range to $30,000. And, but I think time will tell because this has just been implemented at the end of December, 2020. So I'm looking forward to seeing if people will actually be using this avenue and how it will impact creators, um, you know, uh, how they deal with copyright infringement claims and cases. Yeah. And speaking of creators, what are some ways that creators, whether it's on TikTok or on YouTube or on other larger platforms can protect their work, their arts, their IP? Mm -hmm. So I think when I'm going to say it again, that a big, big thing is trademarks. Trademarks is a huge thing. And if we're talking about content creators protecting uh, their work or even content creators who are being reached out by big brands who would like to enter um, licensing deals or, you know, provide merchandise with uh, the brand, they have to make sure that they own their trademark. Otherwise, there's no purchasing deal because that is not a, a set thing. Um, so trademark registration, or for the very least, um, searching to see if your trademark is already in use or if there's someone similar uh, using a very similar name to you um, and you're in the same kind of um, industry, that could be a problem. Um, I think copyright registration is also something that's important. Um, it, on, the, on these big platforms like TikTok or uh, Instagram, if you look at the, the small print, some of the small print may say that um, these platforms have a licensing opportunity and they can use your work. So a lot of people don't know this. And I think uh, it's the information, the information that even if that is the case, it's understanding that you are aware of that. Right. And you know how to move forward, understanding that that is the case. Great advice. Well, yeah. Summer, thank you so much for stopping by and giving all your insights. Um, definitely interested in learning more about these uh, stories or examples that you mentioned about the copyright infringement, you know, that have happened to people in South Africa, the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and here in the U.S. as well. So thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. Talk to you soon. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye.